Amen. Good morning. We're in Mark 14. You want to go ahead and turn that way. We're starting at verse 32. So Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence in the room. And we just ask that you would shape us. You would have your way in our hearts. Lord, give us ears to hear this morning. Give us soft hearts to receive. We need you. I want to just tell them as we transition, we need you, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. I was thinking this week about St. Cyprian. Uh, he was a bishop at Carthage in the year 250, uh, forgive me, 249 AD. He was ordained as bishop. He was a rhetoric teacher and was pretty wealthy and successful and kind of gives up all his money and decides to follow Jesus and What's interesting about Cyprian is that pretty much the entirety of his, uh, his ministry as a bishop, he's under persecution. So on many occasions, he's fleeing um, Carthage and then coming back. And um, at one point, he flees Carthage because he thought that it would be better for him to be alive than dead for the church. And uh, so he fled and he was writing letters to the church and kind of working from afar. But many said that he ran from martyrdom and kind of mocked him. And anyway, he's it's under, the, uh, under Emperor Valerian that he finally comes to his martyrdom. And um, it's interesting to think about because, again, you're at least a decade, he knows every day of his life that, that the government wants his head. Every day of his life, he knows that there's a, there's a cruel death coming sooner or later. And so finally, when the day comes, he's standing before um, Valerian's kind of minions, the pro-council, and they essentially tell him, look, you've been dreading this this day for a long time, this day of death essentially coming, just deny Jesus and pronounce loyalty to the Roman gods and you can have a, a free pass. He responds this way. This is what Cyprian said. I'm a Christian and a bishop. I know no other gods but the one true God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is therein. This God we Christians serve. To him we pray night and day for ourselves, for all men, and for the safety of the emperors. In other words, he's saying to Valerian, I'm not your enemy, but I won't serve your God. So they, they say to him, hey, you've been living under great anxiety for a long time. Here's a free pass. And he says, no, thank you. He stands in trial, honors Jesus. They essentially say, we're going to behead you. You'll be decapitated. And his response is really popular in church history. His response was just to say this, thanks be to God. St. Augustine said, Cyprian, the blessed martyr who shed his blood in the same city where he had been bishop, remained firm even in death, preserving the peace and the concord of the church. This story is interesting when we begin to think about our text today because we're coming to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want to suggest to you that for the entirety of Jesus' life, he was very aware that he was to one day be the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. It is, after all, why John the Baptist pronounces, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is truly God of God. He's also fully man. That's established plainly throughout New Testament doctrine. So in his humanity, he experiences, and we're going to see in Gethsemane, he experiences the same kind of dread and anxiety and, and fear that we all experience when danger is awaiting. Um, and so if you can imagine the entirety of Jesus' life, he's living knowing every day he knows that one day he's going to experience the kind of death that human imagination hasn't fathomed yet, a wildly brutal death. Now, my wife's had a few kids, um, and that might be my fault, okay? I might have had something to do with it. Um, and not one occasion of my wife's pregnancies has she failed for a single day to talk about the pain that's coming. She's Cajun, that, whether you're willing to accept this fact or not, Cajun is an entire different breed of people. Um, and I've heard her tell her birth stories. I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating, at least a thousand times. She tells the story and I have to remind her, I was there, don't have to, don't have to relive it, I was there. Um, but that kind of every day of knowing, I gotta push this thing out. Jesus lives with, and when he comes to Gethsemane, his entire life is, is coming to this pinnacle moment, the cross, 
And the cross is by no means going to be comfortable or easy. It's going to be wildly painful, awfully painful. And in Gethsemane is kind of the last wrestling where, if you think of Cyprian, where there's a ticket laid out before him and he could get off the train or he could stay on the train. He could quit on the purpose, on the Father's will. He could quit on the, the pain. There's this temptation in Gethsemane to quit. But he wrestles down his will in prayer, wrestles down his flesh, the, the kind of weakness of humanity. And he kind of pins it to the ground. And he, he comes up from air and he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Pinning down his own fleshly desire to quit and, and says, God, let your will be done. Now, the, the irony of this text, and just to go ahead and spoil alert really quick, is that while Jesus is wrestling with his own will and pinning it down and praying, God, your will be done, the disciples are asleep. And Jesus, with perseverance in his soul, is going to go to Calvary and have nails driven through his hands and experience great trauma in order to remain faithful to God's will while Peter has a little slave girl come question him and he, no, 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 no. Jesus prays through and finds perseverance in his soul and obedience to God's will. The disciples slumber and sloth and sleep and they're going to deny Christ in a moment of great trial. Let me read you the passage, and I'm going to try to open up these themes for you, okay? I promise you I'm in a good mood. It's just a heavy text. Starting in verse 32, And they went to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came to them the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand as Judas stumbles forward into the scene. Now, it's not hard to remember where we are in the context of Mark's gospel here because we're getting to the pinnacle of the narrative, right? But we've done the entirety of kind of Passover week. We saw the triumphal entry where the crowds shout Hosanna. We saw Jesus come to the temple and overthrow the tables where people were buying and selling. He kind of has these continual fights with religious leaders and he, and he denounces all of Judaism of the day as not being helpful to man's soul, but actually being a detriment, a stiff arming people away from God rather than inviting people into God. He goes to the Mount of Olives where he um, prophesies the destruction of the temple that's coming. And we kind of slumber towards Passover night where he shares his final meal with his disciples. He gives them the cup, said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, this bread is my flesh. Take, eat, all of you. He invites them in some way into his future suffering. And then remember, he said, one of you will betray me. And we talked for a while about the idea that that is Judas. And it's interesting when we read our text today because Jesus comes with the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and he leaves eight behind and takes three deeper. So he goes the deepest in the garden with his three friends but there are only eight back there. There should be nine because Judas is already out plotting and scheming on the action to betray Jesus. Then he said to Peter, remember he says to all the disciples, but to Peter in particular, you will deny me. And Peter says, I'll never deny you. Even if I have to die with you, I'd never deny you. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And, and that's where we kind of slide from right into this garden, Gethsemane. 
Gethsemane is on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives we've seen so far is this kind of place of prayer and retreat for Jesus. It's a place that he goes um, to meet with God in solitude, to commune with God, to encounter God. And now in his moment of great trial and kind of anxiety, he goes back to this place of secret prayer. Gethsemane in particular, it means the place that the olive is crushed or olive press. And there's obviously prophetic imagery there because it's here that Jesus is kind of crushed before the Father in prayer. The olive is pressed, crushed, and then it's pressed again. And as it's crushed and pressed, it releases the oil, the oil we use for like anointing priests and prophets, the oil that has medicinal value. And so there's some imagery of Jesus being pressed and crushed here and kind of bleeding forth from his soul healing and wholeness. He's in his hour of crushing. So again, Jesus says to eight of the disciples, sit here while I pray. And then he takes Peter, James, and John with him a little deeper. And the scripture says, his soul became very sorrowful. Oh, what's happening here? Why, why now? Why now is his soul becoming sorrowful? It seems plain to me because he turns and looks at Peter, James, and John and says, and he says this, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. So Jesus does not say to all of the disciples, hey, I'm really, I'm really struggling right now and my soul is in agony. But he does to these three. He looks at these three, greatly distressed and troubled. It's like he's opening up his heart. He's, he's showing them that he's, he's, he's expressing what we call human vulnerability. This is what I've been carrying, this anticipation, this agony of what's coming. And he, and he kind of opens up his heart and he says to Peter, James, and John, my soul is troubled even unto death, very sorrowful, even unto death. And this is really interesting because he's expressing himself to his closest friends. These are his best friends. But we're seeing his humanity. And what he says to his best friends is, I am so broken. The weight of this might kill me. And he says, pray with me. Watch and pray. Now, this is, again, interesting because he doesn't say that to the whole. He only opens himself up to these few. And there is this process, and I I don't mean to overstretch this here. Let me say it to you this way. Um, At some point in your Christian maturity, in your process of discipleship, you begin to grow, and as you grow, the Lord at times begins to reveal to you places of, frustration and sorrow. So how many of you have ever been sleeping and it's like the Lord just smacks you in the face and says, get up and pray. It's like God starts knocking and says, hey friend, I'm going through something. I'm, and it's not that God experiences anxiety, but God does experience sorrow. There's no doubt about that scripturally speaking. Um, God, God experiences sorrow. I mean, Jesus cries and the father's frustrated like so much in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, he says things like, I, I don't do anything without telling the prophets or telling my friends. He's telling Abraham what he's going to do at Sodom and Gomorrah before he does it. And so there is this kind of concept of, of God waking up his friends, asking his friends to pray, to press. And I don't, um, I don't pick up, I, my, um, my four-year-old was just in here. He's having a morning. Um, he's, he's, he's a little and like funny. He's actually a really like tender kid. But I don't pick Ike up and go, Ike, let me tell you about dad's depression. And what I'm struggling with today, I pick Ike up and I say, let me tell you about Sonic the Hedgehog. Right? And, and so it's not like, I'm just trying to show you that this is a biblical theme. There is this thing that happens in discipleship where as you walk with Jesus for a while, you start to know him a little more. And as you start to know him a little more and you age, like my mom growing up never said to me, Caleb, would you please pray for me? I'm really struggling. But she'll call from time to time now. Because in my process of maturation, and I don't know if you know this, but I'm wonderfully mature, okay? Um, probably the best kid she had. Oh, I'm teasing. Um, but there becomes less of a, less of a, a friendship where, where selfless love is being exposed and, and more of a mutual engagement and relationship. So these three have this wonderfully beautiful moment with Jesus. Or again, it's like where my mom calls and says, I'm struggling and can you pray? And the friendship 
kind of steps forward, right? Vulnerability invites friendship and fellowship. And so Jesus looks at them and says, I'm really, really struggling. My soul is sorrowful even to death. Pray with me. And the scripture says Jesus steps further into the garden, just leaves them a little behind. He steps further into the garden and he falls on his face. And he kind of continually prays and falls and wrestles and prays and falls and wrestles. And he prays this, Abba, Father. You guys know that Abba is this kind of a little bit more of an intimate term. It's not, it's not official. It's personal and intimate. And this is actually the only time in the New Testament, or at least in Mark's gospel, where Jesus uses the word Abba. And it does kind of carry with it this connotation of like, your kid drowning. And when your kid's drowning, it doesn't say father. He says, daddy. Right? And it's like Jesus is drowning and he looks up and he says, Abba. Take this cup from me. So he's wrestling now alone. Take this cup from me. This is too much. And it's again, like all this humanity is just freaking out. We've talked about this before, but we are wired with what we call fight or flight. Um, fight or flight, when someone, this is a physiological phenomenon, when someone stays up too long under that fight or flight mode without fighting or flighting, they just stand there. That's what produces this experience when they begin to, their veins actually begin to bust and they start to bleed out of their skin. So the idea of sweating great drops of blood is that Jesus, everything in Jesus's humanity wanted to run or wanted to throw some punches but instead he just stays up under it. Abba! And then he kind of wrestles down all of his flesh, right? Because this is what he was sent for. This is the entire purpose of all of this is that he would bleed for the nations. And so he kind of wrestles himself down. and And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that is the greatest expression of prayer, the, the, the highest expression of real adoration. And he gets up from this wrestling, this victorious moment where he, where he pinned down the flesh again. It's kind of the, the final wilderness temptation, right? The ticket's being handed. You can skip, you can skip. And he pings it down and he gets up with his victory and he goes to the disciples. And rather than enjoying this like fellowship and this moment of friendship where they prayed through with their friend, they're all asleep. So Jesus kicks them. And, and notice what he says. This is actually really fun. We had so much fun uh, talking about this this week with the, with the team. Um, what he says is, Simon, um, Number one, uh, all three of them are asleep. So why are you calling Peter out? Maybe it's because Peter 10 minutes ago was talking about how he would die for you. And he, he, it's really interesting. This is the only time that he doesn't use the word Peter. Because remember, since this confession, he's the rock. He's Peter. But Jesus, you know, we talk so much about identity and having your new name. But, but Jesus looks at him and says, Simon, who are you acting like now? You couldn't watch with me for one hour? He says, watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting because um, Piper put it this way. It's helpful. There, there are actually two battles going on in Gethsemane. There's the battle Jesus is fighting, and there's the battle the disciples are fighting. They both have a Gethsemane. Jesus' Gethsemane is going to lead to the cross. Their Gethsemane is going to lead to an opportunity to either confess Christ or deny Christ. Jesus is going to prevail again. They refused to pray, and in refusing to pray, failed to persevere. And so they go to sleep. Jesus gets up again, and he goes back to the place of prayer. And he prays, Father, take this cup. I had to wrestle it down again. And there are times in your Christian life where you've got to wrestle it down again. How many of you guys have ever been through some real trauma and you hate that person and you lay in the altar and you, Father, forgive them. I forgive them. And next week you're eating altar carpet again. I forgive them. Sometimes for the rest of your life, you're still praying, I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive. 
There's some times where you got to keep coming back and wrestling and keep coming. Jesus models that for us. Three times he comes to pray, comes to pray, and comes to pray. And I just want to say just really quickly, if our Lord needed to wrestle through some things in prayer in order to persevere, who are you to think you can live this life and honor God while forsaking prayer? Who are you? And I would just kind of say that to the entire Western church. Like, what do you think you are? Jesus wrestled and persevered in prayer. Why are we prayerless? And how can we have churches without prayer meetings? He gets up again. He comes back and there they are sleeping again. And he kicks them. Wake up, dude. He goes back and he prays again. Again, three times he's wrestling this thing down. Abba. He rises and there they are asleep again. And he says, are you still sleeping? Get up and take your rest. Another time, time has come. Our betrayer is here. Now this gets interesting because they actually sleep three times. And then Peter's going to deny Jesus three times. And what Jesus is saying here is, you had an opportunity. The time is up. You had an opportunity to pray with me, to persevere with me, to press with me, but you slept through it. Get up, let's go. And there are windows. I don't know how else to articulate this, but there are just times, and time's not cheap. You can't buy it back. You know what I mean? And there are times where God comes and says, get up and pray. Or there are seasons of your life where you're going through some real hard things, and you know you should be praying. But instead, you kind of, what the early church called, you kind of slumber and sloth. And I just want to say, you're not getting that time back. And they're going to fail because they slept through their opportunity to wrestle in prayer. And the church, in, largely, is going to fail if we always sleep through our opportunities to pray, if we sleep through every prayer meeting. Three times. And then Jesus, uh, Peter's going to deny Jesus three times, and then Jesus is going to restore him three times at the ending of John's gospel. This is really interesting. We were looking at this this week. Um, this is from Craig Keener. Uh, Craig Keener said this, uh, Jesus and his disciples may have arrived at Gethsemane by 10 or 11, which was late in that culture. It was customary to stay awake late on Passover night and to speak of God's redemption. Disciples should have been able to stay awake and keep watch. They'd probably stayed up late on nearly every other Passover of their lives. It's kind of like in our culture, New Year's Eve. Like you, you can't stay up on New Year's Eve. So they missed the moment. Jesus says, get up. The betrayer is at hand. Here comes Judas. And imagine Jesus, I want you to just take 20 seconds. As Jesus comes back. Get up. They look him in the face. And there's blood smeared on his eyes. I've never seen him like this before. He's shaken. We were talking about this this week, and I think this is interesting. When Jesus looks at the disciples and says, I'm sorrowful, even to death. This is the first time that they've ever seen him shaken. Like every other occasion, like I like to think about uh, when they're in the boat and the storm is there and the disciples are trying to throw water out of the boat and then they finally wake Jesus up and you remember they say, don't you care that we're going to die? So Jesus is asleep and they're in panic. But now it's reversed. Jesus is in panic. And they know it. And there they are, sleeping. There are times to rest, and times to rest in God's will and to trust. But there are other times where the Spirit of the Lord comes and shakes you and says, get up and pray. Now, to try to bring us to a place of, like, conclusion. Again, the entirety of the thrust of this is that Jesus teaches us what it is to excel through trial, 
Jesus teaches us perseverance, right? How to, how to hold on in prayer. And he, he's going to go to the cross and he's going to carry that thing up to Calvary. He's going to suffer and pick himself up on the cross to shout, Father, forgive them. He lives out obedience because he did all the fighting in the place of prayer. And, and that's, that becomes a picture of obedience to God's will, even when it hurts, versus this picture of living a life of spiritual slothfulness. And then the first time trial comes, you say, I don't know him. Now look, some of you guys, if trial is not here today, it's coming tomorrow, right? Like trial is going to come. And what happens is you've been in a marriage for 20 years and she's on your nerves. He's on your nerves. And you could get up early and pray. You could go to church and go to marriage counseling. You could just put in the work to honor Jesus and honor this this covenant that you made, or you could start flirting back with that girl at work who's been texting you. You you could confess Christ in prayer. I'm struggling with this financially. I'm, I'm anxious. God, help me. Your will be done. Your will be done. Or you could go back to the liquor that you used to drink, right? Go put some of that down. You'll feel better in a couple hours. And these moments come in life, these trying moments. And in some way, I didn't like write creation, so forgive me, but in some ways, these moments define you. And this is what it means to be pressed and to spill your inner contents. Jesus is pressed and he spills obedience. Some of us, we've lived a life of lust our whole lives, looking at women and, and the, the moment, and everything's fine until your marriage is on the rocks, and then you spill lust. And what's within you now expels out of you. And the, the real issue is that you never learn to pray and to wrestle with God, to lay your heart bare before him, and to confess your sin, right? Confess it to God, confess it to friends, and, So Jesus prays and perseveres. They sleep and deny him. And then Mark lays it out kind of like this. We're in the lesson. No, if I could just backpedal for a minute and be like highly pragmatic and pastoral for a second. We've kind of committed, like, even when it hurts, we're going to be a church that prays and not every prayer meeting is powerful. Not Certainly not every prayer meeting is packed, okay? Um, but we've kind of committed, we, we're going we're gonna to pray. We're, we understand that, biblically speaking, to not pray is sin. It's arrogance. And the early church would not know what it is to be the people of God and not pray together. And so we kind of committed to, to praying for seven days a week. We've been praying, praying, praying. I just want to say that, like, we're not going to back down from that. We're going to press forward, but but we are going to, in the coming months, restructure a little bit. Um, and I try to find the best structure that helps us to fulfill what God's called us to do. And the vision is going to be the same. We're going to get after it. But I'm just like asking you guys to look yourself in the mirror and just decide. Like I'm going to, I'm I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little bit of a license here. Cheat on your diet. Have ice cream on Friday night. Don't cheat on prayer. <laughs> it's, it's funny when sometimes Westerners are more disciplined about our, our diets than we are disciplined about our prayer lives. Yish, yish. You guys know what I'm saying. Don't try to twist that, you sinners. But I, I'm not saying let's be legalistic and let's hate our lives and let's be miserable. Let's try to be the Navy SEALs of Christian churches. I'm not saying that. I am just saying like, oh, and when my request has been, man, we, we get into this next season and even now, man, show up to one prayer meeting a week. I'm not going to kill you. But a prayerless church, when trial comes, it's going to fall. Okay, why don't you stand to your feet? Seth, would you come for me?